you in peace in fullest measure. This is the day that God has made. Let us, us rejoice and be glad in it. <laughs> well, we have um, Easter morning. <laughs> Welcome, we're glad you're here. I invite you to find the register in your pew and sign your name to let us know that you are here. And if you're with us on Zoom, please sign your name into the chat so we have a record of your attendance. Uh, I do have a couple of pastoral care updates. Uh, one is that Paula Wood um, Hargrove. Hargrove fell this morning. Um, and so please keep her in your prayers. Also, we received word that Terry Cheney fell on Friday um, and feels like a bruised football player. So please keep her in your prayers as well. As you know, there will be an Easter egg hunt immediately following the service as well as a reception for our new members. So please join us in the fellowship hall and on the grounds for these events. I also need to bring to your attention uh, two events that I will put in an email for you, all of the details. Um, Friday from 6 to 9 is Earth Day Lubbock, and they need our help setting up and cleaning up, and as well, uh, on Sunday, a week from today at 3 o'clock, there will be a WTOS event. They need our help as well. Um, the Reverend Davis Price has particularly requested your attention to this. And I will send all of that in an email, all of the details. So look for that tomorrow. Let us worship God. Please stand for the call to worship as printed in your bulletin. Christ is risen. Alleluia. Alleluia. Christ is risen.
of God's new heaven and new earth. And let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Trusting in God's grace, let us unburden ourselves to God, that we might receive new life in Christ. Let us pray. On this bright and joyful day, we bring our whole selves to you, great God. While we are thankful, we confess that sometimes resentment takes the other hand. While we are relieved to be reminded of your love for us, we confess that sometimes the call of hatred moves us. While we trust in you, we confess that sometimes we allow fear to Live out a lifetime. 
For one who dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth, and one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. They shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be, and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, or bear children for calamity, for they shall be offspring blessed by the Lord, and their descendants as well. Before they call, I will answer. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox, but the serpent, its food shall be dust. They shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain, says the Lord. Now let us read responsively portions of Psalm 118 as printed in your bulletin. We give thanks to God, for God is good. God save love and forever. Let all God's children say, God save love and forever. O oh God, you are our strength and our song. You are the one who heals. Shouts of rejoicing and salvation echo in your halls of justice. You have triumphed over all. You have triumphed over all. You have triumphed over all. I shall not die. I shall live to recount your wondrous deeds. I have been chastened. But you do not give me over to death. Open to us the gates of justice, that we may enter in your This is your gate, O God. The just shall enter through it. We thank you, for you have answered us. You alone are the source of all healing. The stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is true.
Our gospel reading comes from the book of John, the 20th chapter. Early on the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed from the tomb. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Then Peter and the other disciple set out and went toward the tomb. The two were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent down to look in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen wrappings lying there and the cloth that had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw, and he believed. For as yet, they did not understand the scripture, that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples returned to their homes. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? And she said to them, They have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. When she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary, she turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabbi which means teacher. Jesus said to her, do not hold on to me because I have not yet ascended to the Father and your Father, my Father, my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, good and gracious God, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. In 1591, Pope Gregory the Great gave a homily in Rome, which mistakenly identified Mary Magdalene as a prostitute. This mistaken identity of the first apostle was alive and well at First Presbyterian Church in Dallas, Texas in the last half of the 20th century when I received my Sunday schooling. And perhaps it was alive and well when you received yours. 
In 2016, more than 400 years later, the U.S. Catholic, a news service for U.S. Catholics since 1935, reported this case of mistaken identity in an article entitled, Who Framed Mary Magdalene? Let us be clear. There is no biblical evidence to suggest that Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. There is biblical evidence in all four Gospels that Mary Magdalene was the first at the tomb, the first to proclaim the risen Christ, the first apostle. However, these things do not appear in all four Gospels. The birth of Jesus, Jesus' baptism by John the Baptist, or Jesus' institution of the Lord's Supper. Curious. Of course, Mary Magdalene's identity isn't the only identity to be mistaken. In John's Gospel, she mistakes Jesus for a gardener, which is in fact an apt metaphor. Jesus, the one who tends us to our souls and our sorrows. And in Luke's Gospel, the two on the road to Emmaus mistake Jesus for an uninformed stranger. Shakespeare, too, has many instances of a mistaken identity. The Comedy of Errors, Twelfth Night, As You Like It, Measure for Measure, Otello, Midsummer's Night Dream, The Merchant of Venice, and possibly more. I didn't try to find them all. And the tradition of mistaken identity reaches back to the Greeks and even to the Hebrews. Remember Abraham and Sarah entertaining angels unawares? Mistaken identity allow the characters in the story to undergo transformation. A learning process through which they can come to understand themselves and their current circumstances in life. It is this transformation in one's understanding, a transformation in one's situation that Easter is all about. It is a turning as Mary turned when Jesus called her name. It is a turning from one point of view about oneself or one's neighbors or one's environment to a different point of view, a shift in perspective. That is what our faith is all about, this transformation in the community or communion within which this transformation takes place is Christ's church. God is always seeking us out, but we are not always looking for God. We mistake much in our world for the ordinary, the ordinary gardener, the ordinary stranger, the ordinary guest. When in fact, each person we meet is God in disguise, imbued with God's spirit. There are no ordinary people. Each time we recognize God's spirit in another, we experience one of those turnings, one of those transformations, one of those moments of recognition when everything is bathed in light. 
like Jesus calling Mary's name, or those who recognized him in the breaking of the bread. Every Tuesday, a few of us gather in the fellowship hall to reveal ourselves and our sorrows to one another. If you met any one of us on the street, you'd think, there goes an ordinary stranger, an ordinary teacher, an ordinary mother or father. But when we sit down together and we pray together and we open up our hearts to one another, extraordinary things happen. We experience a shift. We are not the same people we were when we walked in. We are transformed. We are turned into children of God. Children who cry out to each other for a chance at turning, an opportunity to be transformed, an opportunity to be seen and recognized for who we are in our interior, an opportunity to reveal our pain and our disappointment, our anger and our grief to one another. We all long to be recognized, to be tended to, to show our true selves. We all long to be seen and acknowledged in our entirety, not just for our usefulness or our cheerfulness, but also for our precious child of God-ness. We all long for our grief to be witnessed, our sorrow to be exposed, and for those deep, dark places within ourselves to turn toward the light. About once a month, I meet with a spiritual director. She is skilled because she asks good questions. Gentle questions, but good questions. One she likes to ask is, where do you see yourself in the story? She asks these questions because she is inviting me to turn to turn toward my identity as a child of God, over and above my identity as a wife, a mother, a pastor. I think we all need an opportunity to turn, an invitation to reclaim our identity as a child of God, rather than bear exclusively the roles we have assumed in our families, at our workplaces, and in our other spheres. It really is a bit like gardening, tending the Christ plant, watering it, clearing out the weeds, granting shade or sun, adding eggshells for calcium or coffee grounds for nitrogen as the soil needs. I have heard some of you speak of your experiences at Curcio as an encounter with the turning, an encounter with being seen, an encounter of being nurtured and encouraged to encounter your own self in Christ. Somehow, in Curcio, you've learned to see Christ, the gardener, Christ the stranger, Christ 
in one another, and even Christ in your own self. You have told me that Curcio has touched you deeply and touched the place in you where tenderness and joy reside. You might could say, you have heard Jesus call your name. And so think with me for a moment about the courage of the arts to unmask our false identities and strip off our false selves, to take us to a place where we cannot deny our common humanity. The arts, too, offer that opportunity for the turning, for the shift in perception, for the seeing of the light shining in everything. Perhaps at a world premiere in which through the power of music and words and color, you follow the songs which turn us from despair to hope. Or perhaps in choral music, composed a world and centuries away, which allow us to travel through time and space to a world apart, into the depths of human loneliness and desertion. <clears throat> or even an essay which calls us to shift from numbness to sensation, from flatness to the three dimensions embodied in our senses. And so today, God calls us each by name, invites us to turn and to see our whole selves, our bodies and our souls as children of God, and invites us to tend to one another. For Christ is hidden in every corner of every being. And when we see that light shining in everything, when we feel or see or hear or experience the turning, we too burst forth and say, I see, I have seen, I have seen the Christ, the light here in our midst. I have seen the Lord.
let God's people say, Amen. Amen. Remembering God's great love for all the world, now let us offer our lives to the Lord.
friends, this is not a Presbyterian table. This is Jesus' table. And Jesus himself, the host, invites all who trust in him to come and partake in the feast that he himself has prepared for you. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to give you thanks and praise, good and gracious God, for you have promised us a new creation of peace and joy, where the wolf and the lamb will dwell together, and where no one will hurt or destroy on all your holy mountain. Therefore, we praise you. Joining the song of the communion of saints with all the angels and archangels who forever sing to the glory of your name.
I invite the elders to come forward.
Let us pray together the prayer after communion as printed in your bulletin. At your table, giving God, we have been fed. Our thirsty spirits have been quenched. We give you thanks for this taste of your kingdom meal. When the wolf and the lamb will feed together, and peace will reign on all your holy mountain. In Jesus' name, Amen. Thank you. 